I hope it and we're um, <laughs> help reserve bandwidth and also to limit audio interruptions during the presentation. And as a, it just announced, I've just turned on the record feature. So if you do happen to miss something as the presentation goes along, we are going to record it and it will be viewable later. Um, to make it a little bit easier in Zoom, you might want to try viewing it in full screen mode. And if you look in the upper right hand corner of your screen, um, you'll see the speaker view or this little box. And if you don't see that, try wiggling your mouse and it might pop up. Um, and if you click on the little box, um, it should get you into full screen view. That'll make the text on the slides a little bit larger. And then because we are asking everybody to mute their microphones, um, we have decided that we will hold all questions until the end of the presentation. Um, and we do ask that you use the chat function and that's a little box on the bottom center of your screen. It looks like this little chat symbol. And you can go ahead and put your questions in chat throughout the whole presentation. And then at the end of the talk, we'll go through and we'll address the questions in the chat. So um, hopefully that works really well for us. And before I get into the talk, I just wanna talk a little bit about the things that Alaska Wildlife Alliance is doing to help promote our connection to wildlife during this social distancing and this stressing times. So we are switching to um, some remote uh, safe activities. Uh, one of the ones we're doing is tonight. It's our virtual wildlife Wednesdays. Um, our belugas in the backyard is the very first one, but we do have two coming up in the next month. Uh, one is, are you bear aware? And in case you didn't know, April is bear aware month. So we do wanna uh, make sure we have some information going out about how to interact safely as the bears are waking up. And then our Anchorage um, May 20th Wildlife Wednesday speaker has agreed to also maintain his talk virtually. And so he'll be talking to us about being an ethical wildlife photographer. Next slide. We also realized we want to have some fun in this time of stress. So we have created a wildlife bingo game. So this is our bingo card. And the way to play is when we're out with our families, getting our outdoor recreation time, because thankfully in Alaska, we can still do that. Um, we are encouraging folks to take their cameras with them and to take pictures of the wildlife. And then each week during our hunker down period, we're playing a different game. So this week we're playing four corners. And so that means um, in order to win, you need to get a photograph of a hare, a moose, a raven, and a fox. And then you share those photos with us at Alaska Wildlife Alliance. Either you can email them to us at info at akwildlife.org or you can post them on our Facebook page. And if you can get the game that week, you get a prize. Also, when you're out taking your photos, keep in mind that every year we have a photo competition for our annual calendar. And so we'll be announcing that in the fall. And we get some amazing photos from amateur photographers just out and about. So a fun family event. The only thing we ask is no Google cheating. Now you or your family members um, need to have taken the photo. <laughs> Next slide. Um, during this time, we also really wanna make sure we're still educating folks about our unique wildlife. So beginning the first week of April, we started a weekly spotlight species. And so uh, where we tailor our Trivia Tuesday around that species. And if you don't know what a Trivia Tuesday is, follow us on Facebook to play along. And then on Wednesdays, we actually post a fact sheet and a coloring page about a different unique species. So this month, we have already highlighted the ptarmigan, the lynx, the narwhal, and then today we rolled out our Arctic ground squirrel. So um, those are good things for kids if you're having to find homeschool activities. Um, there's information on there that you can use as an educational tool for kids. And then there's also a coloring page that is good for, sometimes we all just need a stress reliever. And so it's nice just to take a little bit of break and, and color. Next slide, please. And those coloring play pages can also be used to play along in a wildlife safari in your neighborhood. Perhaps you've heard of other, um, down in the lower 48, they've been having bear hunts where they're using teddy bears and windows or out front. And as the kids walk through the neighborhood, they try to find how many bears they can find. Well, we wanted to expand that because we are the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. And so we're urging folks to put um, stuffed animals or coloring pages of different wildlife and engage their neighborhood in having a wildlife safari. 
So here are just a couple of pictures uh, that we've put up on our coloring pages. And then one of our conservation coalition partners, the Cook and the Beluga Whale Photo ID Project, they have also started a version just for beluga whales. And so you can color the beluga and as we'll learn in this talk today, belugas have different scar patterns. And so you can make a little different scarring pattern and then turn your photos into the photo ID project. And their website is cookinthebelugas.com. Next slide. And you'll also learn more tonight, um, thanks to Dr. Allison Gardell and her students, the Kenai River dip netting, dip netting cameras. Um, one of them has been angled so that we can see the mouth of the Kenai River. And as we'll learn tonight, belugas have been actively swimming in and out of the river and you can actually remotely beluga watch um, from the cameras. Next slide. And then finally, April is Citizen Science Month. So you can go onto our website and look at some of the Alaska projects on how to engage in citizen science. Some you can do while you're out recreating safely and following social distancing guidelines. Others you can do from your computer at home. If you want a broader diversity of options um, and to learn more about Citizen Science Month, you can go to SciStarter's website and that information is here. Next slide. And as a grassroots organization, you know, we do rely on the support of individuals to continue our work. And so if you do enjoy our educational programming and our outreach opportunities, we do ask that you consider supporting us. Uh, we understand right now that Times are tough, and so um, we'll just let you know of some ways that it's possible. If you are interested and available, you can go to our website, and we have all kinds of op uh, options for donating there. If you shop on Amazon, please consider going to smile.amazon.com um, and selecting the Alaska Wildlife Alliance as a charity. It won't cost you anything, but Amazon will donate half a percent of your purchase price to the Alaska Wildlife Alliance, so that's a really great way. If you like rounding up your purchases to the nearest dollar, there is an app called Roundup that they will take the change and donate it to Alaska Wildlife Alliance for you. Uh, we are still a member of Pick, Click, Give, and then this year we have just become a charity in the Combined Federal Campaign, and that's actually a program tailored to federal government employees and the military, and they can have a portion of their paycheck donated to a charity of their choice, even if it's just $1. Um, so if you, you are or you know of any federal government employees or military members, we would love a recommendation um, when this year's CFC begins to select Alaska Wildlife Alliance. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Allison Gardell, and she is a Kenai Peninsula College biology faculty member who is partnering with the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, or AKBMP, to investigate beluga use of the Kenai and Kasilaf rivers. She has over 10 years of research experience in environmental physiology. And as of fall 2019, Dr. Gar Gardell has led efforts to engage the Kenai Peninsula College undergraduate students in beluga monitoring through successful partnership with the AKBMP. Um, we also have Teresa Becker, and she is currently the Kenai Site Coordinator for the AKBMP. She is an undergraduate research assistant through Kenai Peninsula College's Beluga Research Project, and she has actively engaged in beluga monitoring since the fall of 2019. She's also a natural sciences major at UAA with a pre-veterinary focus. So thank you, and one last reminder, please turn off your video and microphones. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, this is Teresa Becker and happy Earth Day. Thank you for joining our presentation. We are very excited to tell you all about our Alaskan Cook Inlet Belugas. The picture you see in front of you is a view of the mouth of the Kenai River with our resident volcano Mount Redoubt in the background. The view is from one of our beluga monitoring sites called the Kenai Bluffs site. Imagine what a tough job it is to stand on these bluffs with that background and count beluga whales as they come into the Kenai River. I have such a tough job. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Allison Gardell, who oversees the Kenai Peninsula College's part in this project. But before I do that, I'd like to add my own personal thanks to her for all of her hard work and dedication in creating research opportunities for undergraduate students. 
where else can you go to school and get to work with beluga whales right at the start of your scientific career? Thank you, Dr. Gardell. Thank you, Teresa. All right, so I, I also wanna convey just my excitement and gratitude for um, this opportunity. It's been such a pleasure to work on this newly formed partnership and to see its early success. So we're talking about belugas today. So our presentation is all about belugas and we're gonna put a special emphasis on the Kenai River because that's where we're based and that's where most of our work is coming from at the moment. So uh, we're gonna give a little bit of background about beluga whales, um, why they're unique and special marine mammals, why we have an interest in studying them. So beluga whales, um, their scientific name is Delphin apteris leucus. And that just means it's a, a dolphin without a dorf, dorsal fin that's white in coloration. So it's not actually a dolphin, but it's a cetacean, which is part of the dolphin, whale, and porpoise family. But it's part of the specifically the toothed whale group, so odonocetes. So whales are put into two broad classes. They're either toothed whales or baleen whales. So um, these guys are in the tooth category, so they have teeth like us, but um, in terms of how they use those teeth, it's a little bit different. They do use them to capture their prey, but once the prey is captured, they actually ingest that prey as a whole um, versus chewing the prey like we do when we chew our food food, right? So as I mentioned, uh, these guys lack a dorsal fin. So we're showing a picture of a beluga here. You look at the dorsal side of the animal and there's no dorsal fin. That's a special adaptation that we see in beluga whales. And that allows them to, to swim really easily underneath the, the sea ice. So it allows them to maneuver really well, but also given they're going under sea ice and they're part of the mammal group, so they're air breathing, they might need to break through the ice to, um, to surface so they can breathe. And so this um, area, without having that dorsal fin in the way, they have a dorsal ridge instead. And so they're able to break through the ice to create a breathing hole. So it's a really unique adaptation for living in um, habitats that are sometimes covered with ice. And we know that belugas are distributed both in the Arctic and the subarctic regions. So another unique uh, feature of belugas is that they have a really interesting coloration pattern, right? So the, in the adults, we see this bright white color. Um, and that's unique um, um, across the, uh, the cetaceans, this uh, sole white color, and that's another adaptation for living in an Arctic and subarctic environment. But you'll see in early life stages, um, these whales are a darker color. And so that darker color is eventually going to um, transition to a, a brighter white color. So we can use coloration as a proxy for age in these animals, which is really useful. So uh, looking at their size um, and their length, that is, uh, those two metrics are sexually dimorphic, which just means they're a little bit different when we look at males versus females. So in males, uh, we see that they're larger and longer. The males can be about 3,000 pounds and about 15 feet in length. And then the females are shorter than that and they weigh less. If we look at the frontal region of the animal, so this frontal prominence that you see in the head um, is uh, attributed to a special sensory organ that we call the melon, okay? So the melon is what we know as the acoustic lens. So when the am animal generates noise for echolocation, which is a special sensory system that the whales use for foraging, for navigation, those sound beams are going to be pass through the melon, which is in this region, and then they're gonna go into the environment, those sound waves, they're going to bounce off on prey, on um, elements within the environment, and then those waves will come back to the beluga and be received in the lower jaw where the information can be processed in the brain. So it's a really special uh, adaptation these animals have. Uh, you think about the Cook Inlet, it's often very murky. Uh, there's a lot of turbidity due to the, the silt that gets turned up. So they need to rely on this echolocation that, so they can successfully forage and um, also communicate um, and interact with uh, one another. These whales um, also have um, a special characteristic in that they undergo an annual molt. 
So looking across uh, whales and dolphins, uh, this is quite unusual. So belugas will shed their upper epidermis about once a year. So you'll see it turn a yellow color and then that yellow skin will just sort of slough off. Um, this often happens in estuaries and freshwater habitats and the animals will utilize the substrate to help get that old skin off. We don't necessarily see a catastrophic uh, molt event in the Cook Inlet whales. Um, however, uh, we're still investigating that and it could be attributed to the salinity, uh, the low salinity that we see in the inlet. These whales are highly social. So uh, as I said before, they rely on a sophisticated communication system. Uh, they can produce a variety of different noises, um, whistles, clicks, uh, squawks, uh, trumpeter noises, so all sorts of interesting high-pitched, high-frequency um, sounds. And so they rely on those to communicate with one another. And they're often called the canaries of the sea because they utilize these really high-pitched uh, vocalizations. So these whales um, can live to about 35 to 50 years in age. Uh, we have a report of an animal that was at least 49 years of age in Cook Inlet. That's the oldest animal known um, to the Cook Inlet region. Uh, and we age these animals based on the growth rings they deposit in their teeth. And there's new research um, out there on epigenetics and using patterns in methylation. So just changes in the chemical features of the DNA and using that as a proxy for age in the whales. The gestation period for belugas is about 14 to 15 months. Uh, the calves are quite large um, at, at birth. Um, they're about five feet and 150 pounds. Um, and the calves are going to be associated with mom for several years. So they're going to learn from mom um, in terms of how to forage, how to socialize. Uh, they're going to stay with mom for quite a while. These animals, uh, they utilize very diverse habitats. So if we look within within the inlet, the Cook Inlet, uh, we see the belugas go into near shore, shallower habitats, including the rivers. And they mostly do that in the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, specifically for foraging purposes, it's thought that these shallower habitats can provide ease and efficiency for capturing prey. So you often see belugas utilizing the shoreline and they'll kind of push that prey up on the shore bank and then they'll capture it. This often leads, leads to a live stranding, but the belugas are really sophisticated and able to get themselves back into the water. Um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty cool to watch. Um, they are in the rivers a lot, and we're trying to understand their use of that habitat specifically more and more with good research. Um, in the winter months, it's thought that belugas travel to deeper areas of the inlet, deeper water areas that are closer to the, the edge of the ice sheet. Um, however, we know that the belugas do utilize river uh, habitats in the winter as well. And in terms of what they eat, uh, it's primarily fish. Um, and so for Cook Inlet, you can think of salmon and hooligan. Those are our two uh, primary fish species in the inlet, uh, but we also know that belugas uh, eat what, whatever is really available in the area, so that includes invertebrates as well. We're going to show you a, a video of a uh, beluga named Hald Haldemir. Um, he is not a Cook Inlet beluga, and in this video you're going to quickly see him interacting with a kayaker He'll steal his GoPro and then he'll dive down and he'll get it. Many of you may have seen it, but Haldemir uh, appeared in the harbor in Hammerfest, Norway in April 2019 wearing a very tight fitting harness. Um, some fishermen helped him get the harness off um, and because he interacted so well with the people of the harbor, um, they knew he had been previously in captivity and they decided he was either trained uh, by the Russians as a spy beluga or he was possibly a trained therapy animal. Um, when he was first spotted, he interacted with people. They took a lot of videos, playing ball, doing a lot of other things. But one of the first things they figured out was that he did not know how to feed himself when he was either released or escaped from captivity. He was coming in and relying on people feeding him. 
So scientists were called in and they were trying to decide if they should take him into captivity, but instead they decided to feed or to put him on a uh, kind of a controlled feeding program and teach him how to fish. They were very successful with that. Um, and by July of 2019, he was actually out of the harbor and kind of going up and down the coast of Norway. We're showing you uh, Haldemir for a couple of different reasons. He's an excellent example of a beluga. He has all those traits that Dr. Gardell was talking about. You can see that big melon, the perpetual smile on his face. You see him now, he's going down and retrieving the, the GoPro. He's gonna open his mouth in, um, in, in just a minute as, as he comes back up and you'll see those big beautiful teeth of his. Um, you also get to see just how social these animals are with each other. But the second reason that we wanted to kind of show you this video is um, he's a huge celebrity in Hammerfest and kind of his information went all over the world. But we look at this video a little bit differently. What we see is an animal who can't take care of themselves. And in order, he's a success story because scientists came in and taught him how to do that. His continued success though relies on the fact that people in that area agreed to stop interacting with him. And why that's important for him is because it's the human interactions are what are dangerous for him, coming in close to boats, that kind of thing. But with regard to his overall success, he is going to be more successful in the wild, and there he is opening his mouth again, if people stay away from him. And that is what we ask you to do with our Cook Inlet Belugas. Um, we'll talk a lot during this presentation about how they're endangered and what some of the rules are, but the best thing we can do for our beluga wells is to reduce and, and try to stop human interaction with them as much as possible so that they can be successful and their numbers can start coming back. So this is a, a picture of Alaska. I don't, a lot of people don't realize that we actually have five big beluga stocks in Alaska. Um, our Cook Inlet belugas are just one of the five stocks and it's the only one that is geographically completely isolated from the others and the belugas in our stock are genetically distinct. Um, we also have stocks up along the Beaufort Sea, the Eastern Chukchi Sea, the Eastern Bering Sea, and in Bristol Bay. Um, all of those other stocks besides our Cook Inlet stock are healthy and the Bristol Bay stock, for example, is increasing uh, by about 4% every year right now. The two stocks though that you see, the Bristol Bay stock and the Cook Inlet stock, those, neither one of those two stocks migrate out of the areas that they live in. The other ones kind of intermix a little bit and they migrate a little bit, but the Bristol Bay stock and the Cook Inlet stock don't really migrate. And as you can see, the Cook Inlet stock, in order to get to any of the other stocks, would have to go all the way around the Aleutian Islands, and they do not do that. They have been isolated in the Cook Inlet for a thousand or more years. Um, the other side to that coin is the Cook Inlet belugas are not going to leave the Cook Inlet, but if they die off, no other belugas are ever going to come back. And that is a very sad fact. Next. Yeah. All right. So as Teresa mentioned, out of our five stocks of belugas that live in Alaska waters, uh, the only critically endangered stock is the Cook Inlet beluga stock. So um, that's why we have so much research and citizen science and engagement of the public to increase awareness about these special animals. So not only are they critically endangered, but they're not recovering. So their population is not increasing, um, which is very worrisome um, in terms of having a hopeful recovery eventually. So uh, these animals uh, were around 1300 in number uh, previously, uh, but around the 1970s, really around the 1990s, uh, we saw a drastic decline in the numbers for this particular stock. So there's a 70% reduction. And uh, given this drastic decrease, um, NOAA, which is the regulatory body for the um, for belugas, including the Cook Inlet beluga, was able to list uh, Cook Inlet beluga stock under the Endangered Species Act, which is the ESA. 
So this is like an added layer of protection for these animals. All marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, but the ESA provides extra protection for these animals given there's a conservation, um, a population status issue, a conservation issue. So right now we're seeing um, with the estimates, uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they put out the new estimate of 279 whales remaining in the Cook Inlet stock. This is a decline from the previous estimate of 328 animals. And NOAA has put out a comprehensive recovery document um, for Cook Inlet Belugas, and that is available to the public if you're interested in learning more about the potential contributors to the decline. But the major threats we've listed here, including habitat loss, reduction in prey, uh, noise, disease, stranding, and combination of stressors. So there's a lot of effort and research and um, really good work that's being put into understanding why this, um, this particular stock is not recovering despite all the layers of protection that we have um, applied to this particular group of animals. So under the Endangered Species Act, uh, NOAA is able to designate what's called critical habitat for these animals. So we know this group of animals is endemic to the Cook Inlet region. So they are found in the Cook Inlet region. They're genetically distinct animals and they're geographically restricted, right? So we want to make sure this habitat is protected. So NOAA designated uh, the Cook Inlet uh, the majority of the Cook Inlet as critical habitat. And you can see, according to this diagram, we have two areas within that critical habitat designation, area one and area two. So area one includes the Kinnick arm, which is here. Um, and this uh, difference here is just based on seasonal use patterns of the Cook Inlet belugas. Um, so in these areas here, uh, the green area, uh, particularly important for foraging and reproduction, um, seen mostly used in the spring, the summer, and going into the fall. And then the red region here, um, which is, extends into the lower portions of the inlet, are seen primarily for um, other, other reasons, um, but probably also important for foraging um, and possibly reproduction as well. So uh, this red region here is, uh, is including the Kenai and the Kasilof rivers, which we will talk extensively about today. Um, so it's really important to understand that these uh, conservation uh, designations um, and protections have been applied to this population. And despite all these efforts, we're still not seeing an increase in the numbers of these animals. So this slide kind of just to give us an idea of the Kenai River. Um, we'll, we'll talk mostly about the Kenai River because again, they didn't see a lot in the Kasilaf River, although we are still looking. Um, but the Kenai River is glacially fed. It's 82 miles long. And, and for those of you who've never seen it, it's that beautiful green, silty glacier color water. It's a gorgeous river. The lower portion of the river, the lower 12 miles, is an estuarine environment. And, and what that means is that when our tide comes in, our tides are so high, when our tide comes in on a high tide day, it goes 12 miles up the river. And you'll, you'll see salt water up that high. Um, there are 40 species of fish, including hooligan and five species of Pacific salmon that come into the, the Kenai River. So it is, uh, there's a lot of prey for the belugas to come in and, and try and forage for. Both belugas and harbor seals are the marine mammals that forage in the lower li river. We have heard of some other types of whales in the past that have come in, um, but mostly it's belugas and harbor seals. The harbor seals, um, go much farther up the river than just that 12 miles. And in oral histories in the past, we've heard that the Belugas have gone as far as the Soldotna Bridge at the Sterling Highway, and that is 21 river miles up. Um, so we haven't seen them go up that far in recent years, but we do have histories that say they were going up that far. The river, of course, supports various human activities. It's a huge sport fishing and personal use uh, fishing area. Most of our commercial boats go out from the docks 
um, um, just inside the mouth of the river. And of course, it's designated as crit critical habitat for the belugas up to the Warren Ames Bridge. Next slide. So this is kind of a picture of the Kenai River and anybody that knows this river knows how windy it is. Um, so starting out at the Cook Inlet, Allison, um, that's the entrance to the river. You can see that it narrows in there. Um, the, there's a, some viewing stations that are very close to the mouth. Um, one is the Eric Hansen Scout Park that's kind of on a bluff overlooking the entrance. Um, the next major viewing station and one of the main monitoring is that Kenai Bluffs area um, from the picture when we first started. Um, headed uh, farther upriver, you see the docks that are right in there right before the view wildlife viewing platform. Um, there's a deep water channel that goes all the way out from those docks out to the inlet. Uh, the wildlife viewing platform is set in a little bit and this second arm of the Kenai River the belugas fish in here a lot on a, on a really high tide day. Um, they'll come in and they, they'll forage in that area quite a bit, as well as the third arm of the river up by the uh, cannery up a little bit higher. Um, and then you see where the Warren Ames Bridge is um, even higher. That it's, it's hard to tell with a picture like this, but that's actually five miles up uh, river. The belugas come up here all the time. Um, our second main uh, monitoring station is Cunningham Park, a little bit farther up. And um, the belugas will, will go right past this point and continue on upriver. So we're constantly looking for places farther up the river where we can get to by driving, because we're obviously not in the river, um, where we can kind of see exactly where they go. We know we think they go as far as eight to 10 miles up the river. This is the sign that's at the docks um, that kind of talks about the, the fact that beluga whales are endangered and that it, the, the river is uh, designated as critical habitat for them. I say the most important information is down in the lower left-hand corner on your screen. And it just talks about what you should do um, if you encounter a beluga whale and how to interact with them, or more importantly, how not to interact with them. And, we just ask that, you know, if you're out there and you delay your boat, you're launching your boat until they leave the area. You keep at least 300 feet away from them at all times. Um, you steer clear of their path and go into neutral as safety allows. You know, any, any Alaskan, we, we all know this. We do this for our moose that come through. Um, we do this for our bears. You just give them a second to go on about their business and then you go on about yours. All right, so um, given the, the critical conservation status of these Cook and Liplugas, there's a lot of really excellent work that's being done on understanding um, more, more information uh, about these animals. So NOAA, as I mentioned, is the regulatory agency that manages belugas, including the Cook and Liplugas. And in fact, uh, the Anchorage office has um, a recovery coordinator for Cook and the Blugas, and that's Verena Gill. So um, you will see her name periodically throughout this presentation. She's one of the leaders for the recovery efforts um, of this particular stock. So um, what are we doing to understand the belugas? Well, NOAA has aerial surveys that they do uh, periodically. Uh, so these aerial surveys, um, they utilize small airplanes to fly over the Cook Inlet. And they do that to collect information both on the abundance, so how many animals are part of the stock, but also distribution as well. So which parts of the inlet are those animals utilizing and during what times of the year? So typically in March and November, that's when they do the distribution uh, surveys to figure out where in the inlet the animals are. And then in June, we see more of the abundance estimates because um, the, the animals tend to aggregate. They uh, are found in larger groups, larger pods, and so they can um, get a better count during that time. Beluga's Count is a one-day citizen science event that's led by NOAA, um, where we have stations throughout the Cook Inlet, including Tyonic, the Anchorage area, Girdwood area, um, over in Kenai uh, as well. So we bring together citizen scientists um, for a day to increase awareness of Cook Inlet, Inlet Belugas to um, 
allow people to become familiar with their, their conservation status, um, but also give them the opportunity to uh, visualize these animals in their natural habitat. So um, that this event has been going on for a few years and it's been very, very successful and was one of the impetus um, uh, for the, the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, which I will talk about in just a minute. So moving on to the Cook Inlet Beluga Whale Photo ID Project. Uh, this is um, a longstanding project that focuses on cataloging the animals that are part of this special stock, this Cook Inlet Beluga population. Um, and I, I will provide more details about that. The Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, um, Teresa and I are both part of that. And AWA is one of the major nonprofit partners as well. Um, so partners working together to do a, a long-term citizen science project to better understand habitat use and behavior of belugas in the inlet. And then we have PASIC Acoustic Monitoring. Uh, NOAA leads this work. Uh, so they deploy underwater acoustic monitors uh, throughout Cook Inlet, including in some of the rivers, to get an understanding of, um, again, what areas the, the belugas are utilizing, what particular habitats, how regularly. Uh, so a lot of really good information there. Um, this data is coupled with the shore-based op observations that we can um, you know, see visually or from aerial surveys. Uh, and so we're getting an idea of what's happening underwater um, and that's, that's really informative for this work. So this is just um, an overview of those aerial surveys. Uh, this one is for the winter distribution. So this work was done by Verena Gill and others. So that's the NOAA office in Anchorage, uh, where they're utilizing those small planes. And as you can see on this poster, they utilize um, a, a sort of like a sawtooth pattern to capture the inlet. Um, and so they'll take photos um, from, from the air and then they'll use that to collect their data. So um, trying to understand how these whales um, are, are utilizing the Cook Inlet habitat specifically in the winter. Um, so that's a big question right now for NOAA. And then we have the photo ID project. So this is led by Tamara McGuire and it is a long-standing project. So it's been going on for um, a couple decades now. Um, so 2005, almost two decades. Uh, so this work is really critical. Um, what it does is it has the mission of helping with the recovery and conservation of the beluga whales. And it's a very collaborative, um, a collaborative project. So uh, this work is bringing in citizens um, and what they'll do is they will collect photographs, specifically photographs from these belugas that are part of the Cook Inlet uh, beluga stock and they will catalog um, the animals by these photographs. So each, each animal has many photographs that um, represents that animal. And they're able to differentiate between animals by using the natural scars and uh, patterns that we see particularly on the dorsal ridge of that animal. So that's that area on, on the back of the animal, right on the dorsal side, where it, it would be able to break through the ice to create a breathing hole if needed. And so um, these individual characteristics can help us differentiate the animals, but this also gives us really good information about which animals are regularly using which habitats within the Cook Inlet. Um, so for example, in the Kenai River, are we always seeing the same group of 10 animals that are coming up day after day, or is it different animals? So these sort of, um, these photos really help us understand which individuals um, are using what habitats. Um, also, understanding the population dynamics, which animals are um, seen with calves year after year, um, which animals um, are, are, you know, unfortunately some animals die, right? So if we have a stranding, uh, we can ID that animal um, based on the photographs. Um, so it's really good work, really important to the hopeful recovery of, this, of these um, animals down the road. If you would like to contribute to the Cook Inlet Photo ID project, there is a specific website. So 
If you have photos um, of these animals, I recommend that you visit this website and they have a platform where you can put in information about the number of animals that you see, where you see them, um, any other supplemental data, plus of course the, the photographs that you have. So here are some examples of photographs of the dorsal ridge of belugas, and you can see there's quite a bit of variation. So um, this variation helps us associate particular features with a known individual. So as an example, this is Treasure, and you can see that she has an X on her dorsal ridge here. So X marks the spot, and uh, we know that's Treasure. And as I mentioned before, the coloration is also really important. Coloration is a proxy for age, and so we know this darker animal here is likely to be younger than these other individuals that are brighter white color that we see more in the adult age class. Then moving on to the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership. So this is AKBMP. It's a brand new partnership. It was started in June of 2019. Uh, the first monitoring season for the partnership was in fall 2019. Um, and our first coordinator for the program was Kim Ovitz. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and she, um, she, it has now, um, she's now doing her PhD in Canada on beluga whales, uh, but we, uh, we now have Madison Cosma, who is our new partner. So this work uh, is really important, what we're doing. It's a long-term citizen science project. So I talked about beluga's count, which is a really uh, a one-day event, right? This is a long-standing project. It's um, multiple seasons that cover uh, weeks and weeks, so typically a couple of months or so of data, and data are collected every day. So we have particular two-hour monitoring sessions where individuals can sign up and monitor for whales. So this is really about data collection here, and what we've done is we've standardized a particular protocol for uh, collecting behavioral observations and habitat use observations for these animals. So in order to contribute to this project, you would need to attend an orientation, um, and then you would go out with a lead monitor. And after doing those two things, you can then sign up for monitoring sessions on the website. And this is our website here. So you can, you can sign up for that and we are happy to have more and more people join us. And I would just ask, um, it looks like someone is modifying the slides. If you could please um, not do that, it's very distracting for our presenters. So um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but if you could erase <laughs> what you have put up there. I've never encountered this issue before, thank you. So who are our partners? Uh, we have many nonprofit organizations. We have um, our NOAA government agency, that's a federal agency. We have a local university, uh, so KPC, which is part of UAA. So starting with uh, Beluga Whale Alliance, this is a nonprofit organization that is out of Girdwood. Um, and for each of our partners, we have assigned particular monitoring sites for them to lead. So for Beluga Whale Alliance, they are taking the lead on the two sites that we have along Turnigan Arm, um, specifically Bird Point and 20 Mile. Then we have Alaska Wildlife Alliance, which is um, based out of Anchorage, but working with Kenai Peninsula College in the Kenai region in order to lead sessions out of um, Kasilof and the Kenai Rivers. The, Defenders of Wildlife nonprofit organization is based in Anchorage and they are leading efforts for the Ship Creek site. So these are the partners and we also have a really great collaboration with the Cook Inlet Beluga ID project. So we are sharing photos um, and we're sharing data with this project. Um, so it's very collaborative and uh, much of the data has um, similar uses, but it's great to have coordination with this group. Um, they have a long-standing history working on belugas and um, 
it's been a really great interaction. So I would just emphasize that this, uh, this partnership has been really successful thus far. We're recruiting more and more citizens um, as interest is there. We would love to have you join. And we just want to continue um, our practice of good partnership and cooperation. And I think we will see more and more success down the road. So, okay, the fall 2019 season, um, again, uh, our, our interest and our focus down here was on the Kenai River, but I wanted to kind of give you a, an overview um, of the whole fall 2019 season so you can kind of see um, how we did as a large partnership. So the, the season actually went from August 15th through no November 2nd of 2019. Monitors went out to Ship Creek, Bird Point, 20 Mile River, the Kenai River and the Kasilaf River. All of these areas are, are pretty set up and they're known foraging areas. And generally, everybody, people who went out went out for about a two hour session. Okay. For all of the sites for Cook Inlet, um, there were 143 sessions attended over 73 days um, during the project. Belugas were observed at all sites except for the Kisilaf River. Now we did have opportunistic sightings at the Kisilaf River. It's just that monitors on regular sessions did not see belugas. I personally think that we just don't know. We don't have a good handle on when they go into the Kisilaf. So the more information we get from people about the Kisilaf, the better off we are. Um, so of those uh, 143 sessions, there were 230 beluga groups. A beluga group can be one or it can be 20 something. Um, 1,609 belugas were sighted throughout the inlet during that time frame. It doesn't mean that there's that many belugas. Um, it means that some belugas were seen multiple times and in, in multiple locations because they migrate all over the inlet. Um, the belugas observed um, throughout the inlet were exposed to a variety of human activities, um, things like dredging, watercraft, uh, airplanes, that sort of thing. 132 groups that were observed, there was human interaction or one type of human activity going on at the same time. And for 27 groups, um, they were exposed to two plus activities during the time frame that they were being observed. Specifically for the Kenai River, the fall session again was August 15th through November 2nd, but Kenai, the river itself was monitored from August 15th through November 15th. And that is basically because we continue to have belugas right up to the end. We had one beluga coming in every day for the last five days um, to November 15th. And um, so they kept coming in, so we just kept monitoring. Um, belugas were first observed on the Kenai River in the fall um, on September 2nd. Um, 425 belugas were observed during 50 of 79 days monitoring. So for the fall, I mean, you had a pretty good chance if you were monitoring, you were going to see the belugas. They, they really seemed to have the time frames down pat for when the belugas were gonna, going to come in. Um, all age groups were observed in the Kenai River, sometimes traveling six and a half miles or more upriver. We saw 193 adults, 119 subadults, 69 calves, one neonate, and 43 unknown. And unknown just means you saw something um, come up out of the water, but you really couldn't tell if it was white or gray or how, how big it was. And that happens a lot with them. They don't come very far out of the water quite often. Go ahead. So again, this is that same picture of the, the Kenai River. And I just wanted to tell a quick story. We uh, and, we think that people don't understand how much the belugas use the river, but we saw the, we saw the belugas come in on the incoming tide one day and um, there was a group of us out there. We saw them first at the Kenai Bluffs um, in the same area as that first picture. Um, they went up river. We, some, people, some people in our group, there were a lot of monitors out that day, moved over to the docks area and then to the wildlife viewing platform and they continued to see them. Um, then they disappeared kind of in that, that, that area between the, the cannery and the, the Warren Ames Bridge. Um, they disappeared in that area for a little while, so some people went up to the Warren Ames Bridge. They saw them pass by. Other, other monitors were already coming on uh, during their normal time frame for Cunningham, and we raced up there. Um, again, we're driving from place to place. We're not in, in boats chasing them or anything, but we raced up to Cunningham, and we got there. We got there and we saw them pass by literally an hour before high tide. 
and they had come in right after low tide. Um, so they come in an hour before high tide. Um, we ended up seeing them go back by. It was sort of a subset of the larger group. There were probably 10 in the, in the overall group and there were at least somewhere between five and seven that came all the way up. Um, we just stayed there. A whole group of us just stayed there because we knew they had to come back down. And two hours later, they came back down. We, we followed them again down to the Warren Ames Bridge and then again all the way out of the river. The timing for them, they were in this river for seven hours. And that's one of the things that's important information. Um, it was kind of outside of the way we normally monitor, but there was such a big group and they were following, they were visibly traveling up river the whole time. So we got to see them in and then we got to see them all the way out that day. And so they're spending a lot of time in our river. They're there more than we think they are. And they're obviously finding a lot of prey in the Kenai River. This is just a chart showing again that, that differentiation between the age groups, between adults, juveniles, calves, neonates, and, and the ones we're not sure of. Go ahead to the next one. Observed behaviors, one of the things we do is we try and track what they're doing. You know, mainly when they come into the river, um, you see them traveling in, you see them head straight over to the docks or to a deeper area, um, and then they start diving and milling. You know they're, you know they're foraging, they're looking for food. If, if they find it, you usually know that too because they start diving. Um, if there's a fish run coming in, you'll see them turn into the, into the t incoming tide and you'll see them pushing the fish up onto the, the shallower shoals so that they can get the fish in their mouth. Um, that's real obvious too. And when the silvers are running in the fall, you really get to see that run come in and you see the belugas hunting in the opposite direction, usually with seals tagging along. Um, but we see them traveling, we see them milling, diving, and observed feeding. You see some of the other things, the suspect, or, uh, suspected feeding rather. You see the observed feeding, the snorkeling, spy hopping, tail slapping, socializing. They come into our river to eat and to hunt. Um, you, you, we see some of those other things, but you don't see it as often as, as most of the things that are tied to uh, what we perceive as them foraging for, for food in the river. Go ahead. This is a human activity in or near the Kenai River. Um, and if it's marked, it just means it was going on while we were observing the belugas in the river. And obviously low flying aircraft is the number one thing. The Kenai Airport is literally right next to the mouth of the river. <laughs> so of course, we're gonna have a lot of low flying aircraft uh, coming up over the water. Motorized vessels, non-motorized vessels would be kayaks and canoes uh, coming through there. Fishermen either fishing from their boats or oftentimes fishing from the shores. Um, and gunshots, you know, in the fall, the, the flats area out past the viewing platforms and towards the warnings bridge are big duck hunting areas. And um, we, we don't have any judgments on here about whether or not the belugas reacted or not. This, these are just what was happening while they were out there. The conclusions were, again, that their main behaviors were traveling, milling, suspected feeding, and diving. Um, we, did, we did find from, from some of the previous literature as we were researching it that the belugas use the river a lot more than, than people previously understood and for longer times during each day. Um, the Kenai River is a very important foraging site for the Cook Inlet beluga whales and that this study just contributes valuable baseline data for future conservation and policy decisions, but not just policy decisions. We need this data and we need really good data for both the fall and the spring and that, so that we can compare it to next fall and next spring. And as time goes on and we're trying to, to save the belugas, we'll have a better understanding of, of what they're coming in the river, when they're coming in the river, what they're coming in for, and hopefully um, we can get a better understanding of exactly what prey they are catching while they're in the river. Okay. All right, so moving forward, what are the next steps? Well, uh, something that has already been implemented is what's called virtual monitoring. So as we all know, we're living in a pandemic situation. So uh, due to COVID-19, a lot of our normal activity, activities have been disrupted, right? And that includes beluga monitoring. So um, the Kenai Peninsula College, uh, the undergraduate researchers um, at KPC, specifically Kenya Pace, um, she worked with the city of Kenai 
and was able to work with them to utilize their cameras that are positioned at different areas on the river. Um, and one camera in particular is near the mouth. And that camera, they just did a quick shift in the camera angle to position it in a more favorable angle for our monitoring efforts. So now we can visualize that mouth of the Kenai as belugas are both entering and exiting the river. So thank you to Kenya for that. It's a huge advancement for our partnership. Um, and this is the link uh, where you can access that uh, camera, which is in real time. So you're gonna click on the link, you're actually gonna see um, see the river as, as um, wildlife is going in and out of frame, uh, which is really exciting. So this is something that you can do from home. And as I said, it's available now. Uh, we do ask if you do uh, see belugas on the camera, just go ahead and report that data to the AKBMP website. So we have a virtual site now that is accessible thanks to Madison Cosma. And we would like to capture uh, those data um, for, our, for our study purposes. The next project, uh, which we are really looking forward to, lots of excitement for this one, is using environmental DNA to better understand the prey that belugas are foraging on in specific habitats of the Cook Inlet. And for this project, we're targeting the river habitats. And so what is environmental DNA? Well, let's start with DNA. So you know DNA is the genetic material for organisms, right? So environmental DNA is just trace DNA that we find in particular environmental samples. So that could be a water sample, it could be a substrate sample. So if I were to take a sample of, let's say the water in the Kenai River, I'm not, going to find just one type of DNA in that sample. I'm going to find many types of DNA based on what organisms are living in that river system at that time. And so there's a pretty uh, innovative technique called meta barcoding that can be utilized where we can basically get a panel of species that are living in that particular habitat around that time. So what we, we plan to do is sample the Kenai and Kasilof rivers at particular times throughout particular seasons and better understand what prey are present when belugas are seen in the river system. The next study is an acoustics project. So I already mentioned that NOAA is doing extensive work with passive acoustic monitoring. Uh, but there's a master student, uh, Sonia Kumar. She is planning on deploying underwater acoustic monitors in both the Kenai and Kasilof rivers. So again, pairing that shore-based observational data, the visual data, with the underwater acoustics data to better understand habitat use of the Kenai and Kasilof rivers. So here, um, I just want to show you quickly the camera angle. Uh, this is the city of Kenai's camera that's been repositioned for our purposes. So thank you to, again to the city of Kenai for the collaboration on this. Um, and we'll just play a quick game of I spy. So anyone see a beluga in this river? I'll give you a minute to try to spot the beluga. All right, well, if you, if you said it was right here, you were correct. So uh, this, this is a beluga that I actually saw from my living room. So I projected the camera on my TV and then uh, just took a, cam, uh, a picture of my TV, essentially, uh, with that beluga in there. So um, it's really exciting. Uh, we are, we're trying to develop better protocols for this virtual monitoring platform that we're beginning to utilize. Um, but it's a big step forward for our partnership. And we're really happy about engaging other citizens, other instructors, educators in the area who might want to utilize this technology. Um, it's honestly, it's a community effort. And so we want to just recognize the place and the people that are enabling this, um, this growth in, uh, in our efforts to monitor belugas in the Kenai and Kasilof. So uh, moving on to the acoustics, um, I mentioned belugas are called uh, canaries of the sea. They have a lot of high pitch frequency uh, vocalizations that they utilize. Um, so I wanna first share with you a sound clip of beluga feeding. And this comes from NOAA Fisheries. So I'm gonna play that for you right now. So 
So you could hear there was just a pulse of clicks that was generated. Um, that's that echolocation that we talked about previously. Um, and at the very end of the click, you could hear the beluga snatching up that, that fish or whatever prey species it was. So successful kill at the end. <laughs> um, the next clip is gonna show us the variety and diversity of beluga vocalizations that are out there, including uh, squeaks and squawks and trumpeter noises and uh, whistles and clicks. So um, this is a little bit of a longer cli uh, clip, but you'll hear a whole variety of noises. So I'm gonna play that one next. quite what you expected. And yes, all those noises really did come from a beluga. <laughs> but hopefully now you can appreciate why they're called uh, the canaries of the sea. All right, um, so we just want to recognize uh, some of the literature on belugas that were utilized for this presentation, as well as uh, funding sources uh, that allowed for this work to happen, including NOAA Fisheries, the National Science Foundation's F-Score, program, as well as UA University of Alaska Anchorage's Community Engagement and Learning Center. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. And at this point, we'll take questions. And just a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat feature. So we do have some questions. The first one comes from Diane. And she says, you mentioned protections in place for the belugas, since they are classified as endangered. With that in place, why is it that Hillcorp is able to violate these protections and expand offshore oil and gas explorations, including seismic blasting? Allison, would you like me to field this one? <laughs> well, I would just say, um, yeah, I, I would like you to take the bulk of it, I would say, but I, I agree with the concern there, and I think there is an extensive permitting process given their conservation status, but yeah, maybe Mandy can speak to the details of that process. Sure. And just for background and why I can speak to this, I used to work for NOAA Fisheries for 11 years, so I'm familiar with this. And um, both the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act have provisions to allow for the authorization of incidental harassment of species like beluga whales. And incidental means that the point of the activity is not targeted to belugas. It's kind of a side effect. It's incidental to what their real activity is. And so Hillcorp did apply for, and after reviews by NOAA Fisheries, they did receive authorization. And so that was able to happen because the agency determined that the activity would not jeopardize the continued existence of the species, nor would it adversely modify critical habitat. So they did go through a permitting process for that. We have a question from Luke. He says, what types of fish are there? And I believe this question popped up during this slide on the Kenai River. So perhaps mm -hmm. what are the fish in the Kenai? Yeah, Teresa, do you wanna take this one? Well, then I have to unmute first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, people, people can probably throw out more than I can possibly uh, think of, but again, hooligan, um, there's five different um, types of salmon that come in the river. There's um, sunfish, there's um, uh, Dolly Varden are in there, trout. There's all kinds of fish. There's all kinds of invertebrate, all kinds of things come in from the inlet um, that don't necessarily come all the way up the river, but they, they come in partway. What did I miss you guys? Yeah, 
I think we often see cod and sometimes even yeah. halibut too near the, the lower portions of the river. Thank you. We have a question from Karen. She says, do they live or hunt in family groups or pods? And is it matriarchal? Do you want me to answer this one? Sure, go um, ahead. Uh, well, I, and I, yeah, you can probably just add a little bit more to it, but um, yes, they live and hunt in pods, um, but the pod could be just one beluga or it could be many belugas. And um, sometimes, um, like if, a, if a, the females have calves, the females and the calves will separate from males and sort of create their own subpod for a while. Um, so the pods kind of change around a little bit, but yes, they absolutely live and hunt in pods. And then, yeah. Did you have okay. more to add? I was just going to say, yeah, and the, the older females are really critical, as we see with other marine mammal species as well, for transferring that knowledge um, to younger individuals. And then our question from Cedar is, does a healthy female typically have a calf every year? From, uh, from the reading I, I've seen, it's usually around every three years. Um, I don't know, Mandy, if you have anything more specific to add to that, but I, I don't think it's every year, especially with the longer gestational period. I think it's uh, about every three years or so. Yeah, that's uh, correct on average. So. Yeah. And the, the calves actually nurse, right, Mandy? Yes, they, they are affiliated with their mom for several years. And so they can be nursing for about two years. And um, the moms only have one calf at a time. Belugas do not have twins. And I don't see any more questions in the chat. We'll give it maybe just another moment in case somebody's typing. Um, but while we're waiting on that, um, I just want uh, on behalf of the Alaska Wildlife Alliance, our board and our staff to say thank you. Um, First to Allison and Teresa for sharing this information for us tonight. And I wanna let everybody know that they volunteered their time to put this presentation together and to actually give the presentation tonight. So um, let's all give a virtual clap to them for donating their time. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Jesse says, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanna say thank you to the Kenai Peninsula College. Um, they allowed us to use their Zoom account for this. So thank you very much to the college. I want to say thank you to all of those of, out there who are um, AWA members or supporters. Uh, without your donation and support, we could not offer these educational programs, so thank you. And then to everybody who participated tonight, I just want to say thank you for caring about Alaska's wildlife and wanting to learn more. And we do have a couple more just thank yous um, in our chat, and then I saw a couple of claps come in on the, um, the sidebar. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions, so I just want to say um, hope everybody stays healthy and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>